Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. It means, Mr. Speaker, that we have inherited a projected overspend of £22 billion. Pounds. A £22 billion pound hole in the public finances now. Yeah. Not in the future, but now. The Chancellor speaking in Parliament there over the summer. So less money, more problems. Could some new rules help? Hello, you're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Stephen Carroll. And I'm Ewan Potts. Welcome to Thursday's show. Did you get my Dua Lipa reference? I did, actually. Yes, Good. it took, it took a little, little bit of time, I have to say. Yes, indeed. <laughs> In case you missed it, it's a Dua Lipa song, New Rules. Uh, and that's what we're talking about today, because we love a rule, and now I've got some new ideas. I hope you might give me a little rendition, but... No, sadly. <laughs> Only on special occasions. All right, well, before we start talking about the plan for some new fiscal rules for the government, I think it's worth a little look back at the current rules. Now, the first fiscal rules in the UK were adopted by the new Labour government back in 1997. I guess the idea was to reassure markets that government spending and borrowing would follow some kind of framework. But the problem is that framework has shifted. In fact, the UK's rules have changed, wait for it, no fewer than nine times since they were first introduced. So the current version dates back to November 2022. The key part of this is that debt as a proportion of GDP or the size of the economy should be falling by the fifth year of the rolling forecast period. It just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, Labour has promised in its manifesto it's going to abide by this rule, but there's been a general shift in all across Europe, in fact, in the debate around how you manage debt and public spending. Of course, austerity was very in vogue for a long time. Post the COVID era, though, where government spent so much more money, the attitude has been changing around it as well. And that has led many to ask if the current debt rule is fit for purpose. Well, luckily, some of the wonkiest brains at Bloomberg have been uh, looking into this. And uh, we've got one of them in the studio today. That is our chief European economist, Jamie Rush. Now, Jamie... Why do the current rules? That's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> Why do the current rules need looking at? What's what's wrong with them? So I, I, the, the main problem with the current rules is that they don't create the right incentives for the government to think ahead. So they're, they're at this five-year horizon, uh, you don't yet experience the the benefits of uh, of the sorts of policies we need to kind of transform the economy. So the basic, the basic point is, if you want to raise investment spending now. The fruits of that won't be won't arrive until some time in the future, and so unless you unless you account for those, you're always going to underinvest. So that that's the that's the main problem. Um, it's just a, it, they encourage short term thinking. So what motivated you then to come up with a, a new plan or a new proposal for how these rules should work? Was it because essentially things are bad, as we just heard from Rachel Reeves? Yeah, I mean things are bad. I mean, if you look at the the path of investment spending that the government has set out, it's falling to it's, it's supposed to be or intended to fall well below our G7 peers. And that's, that's not what we need. We need more investment to raise productivity to, to help grow the economy. So, I mean, when we set out to think about what rules to, would work, what we didn't set out to do was just try and find the rule that gives you the most fiscal space. That's not the objective. The objective is to You're just... You're not trying to give Rachel Reeves a free pass here. Exactly. That's not, the, that's not the point. The point is to create the right incentives to invest and account for investment properly. And that's what we've done. So, as you say, investment is uh, lack of investment is something which has bedeviled the UK economy, all parts of the UK economy, for, for a long time now. Just talk us through the, the main elements of, of, of your plan. What, what are you proposing? So, the, the main element is just to extend the horizon over which the government is judged when it comes to its fiscal rules. So, instead of between years four and five, our rule is to set plans for spending and for tax that would get debt falling with a good probability over the following five years, so years five to ten. Uh, and by doing that, we can explicitly take account of the benefit of those policies because higher investment will lift the size of the economy, it will raise tax revenues, and so it will start to pay for itself to some extent. Not all, but some of it. And is, so that's what it does. Is that the general thinking in economics, that if you do invest, you kind of do start to see results in, in 10 years, just not in five? Yeah, it just takes time for the, the capital stock to get bigger and for that to, to, to yield rewards. Um, and then you also have the possibility that the private sector may crowd in around that investment. You know, you're going to build a train station somewhere or 
uh, you're going to find that businesses will crop up around that hub and that takes time to feed through. But that's a really helpful example, actually, because I think when we think about how this theory that, you know, if the government starts, plants the seed with spending some money of trying to understand how the, the rest of the economy moves around it is, is a kind of good point to bear in mind. Another element that I, I picked out of this plan as well is the current rule says that for every extra pound of investment spending needs to be paid for by a close to a pound of spending cuts or tax hikes to balance the books. You think that should be changed as well? Well, this is it. So if you do it on our metric, the, the what it costs you in terms of upfront tax hikes or spending cuts to finance the extra investment, instead of being a pound to balance the books, it's 50p to balance the books because it recognises that benefit over the long term of raising investment spending and what that does to the economy. So that, that is a crucial pillar of the, the framework we're proposing. Um, the, the current rule, debt falling as a percentage of GDP by the end of the five-year period, ha- has been much criticised, hasn't it? I won't get into the detail of that. But it does have the advantage of simplicity. Now, now is you're, that simple? Do we, well, do we think that's a simple thing? Well, it's thing? fairly simple. I, well, my point is, I think it, it's it's more simple than the proposal from, from Jamie and his <laughs> colleagues. So <laughs> your proposal is not that, always the you know, guiding principle. Is that the, the debt ratio should be declining with the probability of of 70%. Can you just sort of explain how that's worked out? It, it, it yeah. does risk being a bit vague, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, at the moment, the government is implicitly targeting debt falling with the probability of 50, just you know, just over 50%, right? Because it's just saying that it wants to get debt to go down. So there is already a, a probability baked into that. Uh-huh. Um, our probability is, is actually a bit tighter. We want, we want the public finances to be on a sustainable downward trajectory. We picked 70% just because... The European Commission has picked 70%. There are international peers who are doing the same. But the important thing here is that this is an important element of flexibility because there are times when fiscal risk isn't the most important risk. And you might COVID, be willing... for example. Yeah, exactly. Or when, for example, um, you, might want to, you might think that the existential cr- the risk posed by climate change is worth taking on a bit of fiscal risk to address. Or security threats as they have evolved over the past few years, may again lead you to think, well, we'll take on a bit more fiscal risk, but we'll use that that money to try and tackle these other risks. So that 70% is not set in stone. It's for the government to decide. And I think this is actually an important element of flexibility to allow the government to respond in a way that is kind of clear to articulate to markets uh, to those evolving uh, those evolving trends. So I, I think it's actually that's a, that's a useful feature of the rule as well. I think it, it's helpful too to think about what other countries, and I, I mentioned the conversations happening in lots of places around, you know, moving on from austerity and, and having to reassess debt rules, particularly after the pandemic when governments spent so much more money. There's been some tinkering with the rules in Europe as well. How would the, your proposal then fit in with what other countries are doing? It, it has it actually shares some elements of it. So the, the idea of getting debt falling over a, some medium term period is that's similar to what the European Commission does. The idea of targeting a probability, again, is, is another is another sort of safeguard that the Commission thinks about. So it's, it's kind of taking what we think are the best rule, elements of those rules, applying them to the UK, and then adding a couple of other bits and bobs on for safeguarding purposes. Would it essentially mean that it would be much easier, the UK essentially can go mad and spend loads of money uh, compared to perhaps, you know, more frugal neighbours of ours? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, so the idea is not here... To, to create loads of room to spend. The point is just to recognise the cost of investment correctly. So I mean, investment spending is not free. We shouldn't pretend that it is. And so th- there are some proposals on the table which, which are basically akin to saying, well, just take that out of the take it out of the fiscal altogether. We don't think that's the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is to appropriately account for it um, and the benefits that investment brings. So we're not. it's not a, a carte blanche to just spend as much as you like no so, so so not loads more room to spend but but obviously some more room to spend can you just put a, a, a figure on how much extra headroom this might give the chancellor well i mean we've on this condition we've done 70 percent um it's about 30 billion of headroom relative to well, they, they have about 30 billion of headroom which would be enough to to ease the squeeze on government departments that's already penciled in it's not credible anyway there's no way they can cut spending that much so actually i think one of the if they were to adopt a, a strategy like this uh, a rule like this then the first thing to do would be to pencil in less tight spending powers in the future that would raise the credibility again of the whole framework because this is part of the issue is it does feel a little bit like every time we get these estimates everyone says ah oh, yeah five years i'll see you then and we'll see what sort of results we got out of it as well does does your plan sort of address that that credibility issue will it be a bit easier to track whether or not governments are actually going to obey by it or they're just pushing 
there are yeah. problems down the line. I mean, we've tried. We've tried because uh, we've tried. We, what we've added is a clause which says that when fiscal consolidation is required by the by the rule, um, it should be spread evenly across the next five years. So it means you have to get going straight away. So that the fiscal action does take place in each of the five years of the current parliament to deliver fiscal sustainability in the following five years or the next parliament. Mm. So it it is it, it it does kind of constrain them to to act, uh, which we think is a, a positive. When it comes to penciling in ludicrous spending plans in the future, I mean that's just rather difficult to to avoid them from from doing. So either you have to get the OBR to kind of rule on it and whether it's actually credible or not maybe there's maybe there's an enforcement mechanism that way but there are probably other enforcement mechanisms you could you could work on we've just picked one that we think is reasonable it's, we're not wed to it i mean you could change it and it'd be fine and wh- one of the other tweets that's been talked about is changing the way that the bank of england's um liabilities are, are accounted for on the government's books is it, could, could the could the government credibly do your change and the other change uh, and and get away with it yeah absolutely i mean there's no it doesn't really matter this kind of framework it doesn't matter what the debt metric is you just pick the one that you think is the right one uh, and so again it's about picking the one that creates the right incentives here um and i think there are, there are basically a few a handful of proposals on the table one is to basically take the bank of england out of it which is probably sensible um mm. And then because it, it, it depoliticizes the process of QE and QT. So I think you can just take that. That's the incentive that it creates. It gets rid of that, that problem. Um, there's another one, which is to basically recognize investment as an asset. Uh, we, again, I think that's not quite right because it's not completely free. I think that that would be going too far. And I think that would be actually testing the market a bit if you switch to that definition. That's public sector net worth. And then there's another one, which is to take the policy banks out of the out of the the government's uh, debt metric, which I think that has merit because you don't want them to be constrained. You want them to be doing lending and uh, earning interest on those loans uh, without interference from the government. And again, that that creates the right incentives. Loath as I am to bring up Liz Truss and that moment in the UK's financial history, does is there a risk that no matter what changes you make to these rules, that there could be a bit of a, a panic about it? And, and I suppose. You know, how do you make it credible for markets if you're going to make these changes? Because a lot of people will just say you're just doing it because it's politically expedient. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think the market would have any, any particular issue with this type of rule. It's not like, it's, as I said, it's not it's not carte blanche to spend. Um, as ever with these things, what matters is what they then do with the money that they're going to raise. So if you're going to spend loads on public investment that's going to grow the economy, I, I suspect most people in markets would agree that, that that's a relatively wise thing to do. If you're just going to give... Uh, tax giveaways to rich people not so much so i think that's the difference is you know it depends what are you going to use all this money for mm, not just how much how much you spend but also what you spend it on fantastic stuff all right that's jamie rush our chief european economist interesting proposal on changing the uk's debt rules because it's just four weeks now until the budget it seems like mm. it's been a long time plenty of time to read jamie's paper and perhaps take on some of the- <laughs> it's actually not that long and it's in bullet point form on the website which is excellent <laughs> uh, thanks very much to jamie that's it from us for today if you like the program don't forget to subscribe give it five stars so other people can find it on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you listen this episode was produced by tiwa adebayo and our audio engineer was sean gostamakia i'm ewan potts and i'm stephen carroll we'll be back with more on monday this is bloomberg Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.